Hello, it is March 30th, 2023, and it's my pleasure as Dan Hammermesh to have with me today two experts on the economics of education. Uh, first, Kiponya Telhai, who's a reader in economics at the University of Sussex in Brighton, England. And Eric Taylor, who's associate professor of education economics at Harvard University, which people probably know is in Cambridge, Mass. Okay. Anyway, good morning or afternoon, Skiponia. Good morning and afternoon. How are you all doing? Oh, well, thanks. Thank thanks for having us, Dan. It's my pleasure indeed. Let me start off with asking this. I mean, a lot of these questions would be quite strange. Let me start off with asking Skiponia uh, a weird, weird question. So take two children age 18. They finished secondary school. And one of them has bounced around from one school to the next over their previous 12 years of schooling, just because the family keeps on moving. The others stayed with the same peers for all 12 grades. How different would their performance be on a standardized test when they are age 18? Let's say some university entrance exam or SATs in the US. Yeah, so student mobility actually has been a focus of policy interest for a long time in the UK, but also elsewhere. And this is because uh, it's, there is evidence that schools that have high student turnover, they tend to do much worse than other schools in terms of their student attainment. Now, of course, we can find easily think in way of theoretical, having theoretical explanations on why we might think that student turnover might be negative for student attainment. This is because it breaks their continuity of learning, but it's also maybe it's costly for schools as well, because of course they disrupt teaching and learning, and it also takes time and efforts for students to assimilate. So uh, there is evidence, but, but not that much as we would have liked, especially from economics, there is evidence that suggests that there is a, a strong association between student turnover, a negative association between student turnover and uh, student attainment. And this is mainly when, as you said, mainly when the student uh, attainment is involuntarily, right? So the students move just because their family move and not because they want to be to a closer school or closest that matches their preferences more. And okay, let me ask this. Let me interrupt. Let me ask this. So clearly, I mean, the fact has been established that kids do worse the more they bounce around. Is that because they have different peers each time? Or is that not a major contribution? So I'm going to uh, give two explanations for that. So students themselves, by moving, they, in a way, they really disrupt their learning. So research has found that on average, you'd expect that the student, if he or she switches school once, they uh, lack in learning by about two to three months than other students that stay put. So that's and that, a lot. That's, it that's is, a substantial it, it, loss. It is a lot. And if the, the more you move, then the higher this um, negative disruption can be. But on the other hand, as you say, it's also the peer effect as well that has an impact here because student turnover has a spillover effect, not only on students who move themselves, but also on stayers. And I've been involved myself on a research, of a paper that we published a few years ago, we find that if a stayer or a student, an immobile student was faced in a classroom with, with high student turnover, their attainment was negatively affected and they are put back by about one or two weeks in terms of learning than students who didn't face a high student turnover. So in terms of peer effects, it's, it's a bit lower, but who really suffers most is students who move. So okay, well, let me, uh, but, let me what, now ask this. So what yes. you're saying to summarize, it's not just the movers who lose out because of the moves, but their moving has a spillover effect on those who don't move. So exactly. my goal as a parent, if I had school age kids, which I certainly don't, would be to make sure they go to a district where not only they stay, but the rest of the kids stay there also. I want to be a stable district as well as a stable kid. Yes, the spillover effects are, of course, are much smaller. And also, I would like to highlight that we need more causal studies because what we found so far is pretty much just associations. And unfortunately, economists need to really haven't worked much on, on this particular research question. And we need more uh, uh, research evidence from economists to really firmly say, by, I mean, we know that it's negative on average, but what the size is. That's what we, I think we need more research from economists. I think like most important questions, looking for causal stuff 
would involve things which are absolutely unethical, like telling people to move around, which is why I think so-called causal studies are capable of only finding the narrowest of answers. But I'm very prejudiced about this. Let me ask Eric a question, okay? Do teachers matter? I mean, we can all think of our good teachers we've had over the years. I, mean, I think back 60, 70 years, the ones I had. And I know which ones were good and which ones were lousy. But does it make any difference to kids' performance on standardized tests or other measures? Eric, no. what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think we all have that same experience individually, Dan, that we look back over our own education and we can identify teachers that seem to have been made larger contributions to our own lives. I think what, and, and for decades, right, going back to the 1970s, this question of how much do teachers matter has been of interest to economists. Some of the earliest work by Rick Hanushek and, and Dick Murnane and, and others. Over the last decade and a half or two decades, there's been just sort of an explosion of of research on this topic, as many of the people viewing this will will certainly know. And what that uh, research demonstrates is that there are substantial differences between teachers. Those differences appear first in, in the short run uh, when we look at test scores at the end of a school year and compare outcomes for students of, who get assigned to different teachers. There are large differences between those students um, in how much in what their scores are at the end of the year, suggesting that some learn more math and language and other subjects because of the teacher that they were assigned to that school year. But then, uh, you know, there are fewer but but really important and interesting studies that follow students uh, in, in in the years to come, showing that teachers, you know, your elementary and middle school and high school teachers also have an effect on things like uh, your success in college and your success in the labor market later on. And also sort of on the new frontier of this research, there's there's some some uh, really interesting work looking at teachers' effects on other kinds of outcomes beyond test scores in math and language, uh, things like teachers' effect on students' social and emotional and sort of behavioral development, where there are also big differences and also um, long-lasting consequences. Let me ask you this, taking off on all this evidence, does a really good teacher matter more in the primary grades or in secondary school? Any evidence on that? That's in terms of evidence, to answer the question about evidence, we have we have much less evidence about teachers in uh, you know beyond age 16, where uh, the school day for a student becomes much more complex. Um, and where there, where there are fewer tests. We have more evidence from the earliest grades. In the United States, that would be elementary school and middle school where there are more tests and uh, where it's a little bit simpler to understand the process by which students are assigned to teachers. Okay, compare first grade to eighth grade. Yeah. Where is it more important that I get a really good teacher? Yeah, I mean, empirically, I don't think we have an answer to that question. That would be a great uh, thing to, to to invest some more thinking in collectively among those of us who study this. But I mean, I think, you know, drawing some sort of speculation, some informed speculation from, say, some of the work that uh, Jim Heckman has been doing on, on early life, I, I suspect that, you know, those early grade teachers have important effects be precisely because uh, there are complementarities over time in, in educational inputs. And if you have a great first and second grade teacher, that's probably putting you on a trajectory that's different from someone who doesn't. Uh, and of course, then, then those benefits can accumulate uh, over time. And that's probably part of why there are long run benefits of your elementary of teachers. So and I can see that. And I can see why in measuring these things, I'll find some teachers are good and others not good in terms of the output. But what are the I mean, I know who my good teachers were at all levels. And yet, what are the characteristics other than saying anecdotally, this one's good, that one is not? I mean, to me, that's the important question in terms of solving problems. Do we know anything about that? 
Well, we've certainly been looking for a long time for <laughs> what characteristics of individuals might predict who uh, makes larger contributions to student achievement and who makes smaller contributions. And, and, and you know, the, the sort of simple conclusion, it may be an oversimplification, is that we really haven't found anything. The, the, the best predictor, so things like whether you have, uh, at least in the United States, things like whether you have a formal certification in teaching doesn't, doesn't seem to be very helpful in predicting whether or not you're more or less uh, effective at teaching. Um, uh, the one thing that does seem to be predictive is experience. So first year teachers, compare just first and second year teachers. Uh, a teacher in their second year of teaching is, is much, much better uh, than a teacher in their first year on average. Of course, sort of all of these things are, are on average. Um, uh, and that has real consequences for managing the teacher workforce and thinking about the assignment of kids to teachers and in some of the dynamic ways that we were talking about a minute or two ago. So it, it is something, but it's not a lot. We, we, we haven't made much progress on understanding uh, why there are differences. So between one year experience and no experience, I can see that. Does that marginal increment level off? So after three or four years, extra experience gains very little, or is it monotonically increasing? We have several estimates now, and they all show a similar pattern of diminishing marginal returns to experience. So, you know, the the there's sort of a curve that tends to flatten out. Uh, sometimes after, in some estimates, after five or six years, in some estimates after eight or 10 years, um, the biggest gains from year one to two, you know, also important gains from year two to three, but then flattening out. And final nasty question on this point. Uh, does it start turning downward after some point, or we don't have any evidence on that? We don't really have any good evidence on that. That that That's partly due to, you know, there's, there's some, some some interesting econometrics behind the problem of how you estimate these returns to experience. And, and, and that has so far focused, the sort of development of those methods is so far focused on the beginning of the career, um, not on the, the end of the career. I don't even talk, I'm talking about 10 years out. We talk oh, about the, yeah, it doesn't look like that, years. yeah. Okay, it's just flat. It, it looks mostly flat okay. through that middle part of the career, on average, you know. Okay. Let me move on and ask both of you guys, both of you people. So we know that somebody in the 90th percentile of earnings is earning maybe three times what somebody in the U.S. at the 25th percentile is earning. And there are lots of reasons for that, different education. But if I adjust for everything, education, age, race, gender, location, union status, how much do teachers matter in that comparison, which, after all, is a crucial comparison for inequality? Any thoughts, Scaponi, on this? I'll, I'll probably let Eric to start first. You know why? Because most of the studies have stemmed from the from the U.S., <laughs> and then I can then join the discussion. Good. Well, Dan, you asked a really interesting question that that I have not, you know. I have not sat down to to try to work through uh, on a sheet of paper. I'm not sure that I've seen anybody else try to do that too. I mean, I think what we can say from um, uh, from a really uh, seminal piece of research by um, uh, Raj Chetty, John Friedman, and Jonah Rockoff is something about um, sort of the magnitude of teachers' effects on income at age, I think roughly 28 uh, in their study. So that's not controlling for the things that you were asking to control for, Dan, and, and I'm not sure what the answer would be if we did control for those things. But, you know, having a teacher who is, uh, if you have a class of students, like I, perhaps the sort of the key result that they come to is if you have a class of students who are taught by a teacher who is one standard deviation uh, above the median teacher. How I'm much of that very briefly? So that's somebody in the 84th percentile of teachers right. rather than yeah. the 50th percentile. Go ahead. And, and how much more do those students earn uh, in that class collectively over their lifetimes, sort of in net present value terms, 
And it's sort of on the order of a couple of hundred thousand dollars in the United States. So um, those are, you know, one reason to think of the number in that way is to think about compensation for teachers and the value that the, the value in that sense that they're adding to the class that they've been assigned. So, but, you know, for an individual, that's, you know, that's more on the order of a couple of percentage points in terms of, of, of earnings. Um, so it's not going to explain all of the difference between the 90th and the 25th as you were posing it. But I'm not sure controlling for the things you were mentioning what what it would be. Well, the problem controlling though is that some of the things we control for, like eventual educational attainment, is itself affected by having a better rather than a worse teacher. So yeah. I'm not sure how one could tease out. The, I think the question I asked is too general, but it's still the important question, I think. But it's a good point that part of the benefit is uh, how having a great teacher in fifth grade for math might influence some of the things uh, that you listed. Um, you know, the simple example is having a great teacher for math in fifth grade also improves your chances of going to and finishing college. And that's part of why uh, someone at age 28 is earning more money, but it, it doesn't seem to be all of it. So. Right. Scaponi, any thoughts on this question? Yes, so what I wanted to add is that most of, no, it is true, it, it's sad that in the UK, but also in Europe, we can't really uh, look directly at the impact of teachers on students. And the reason is because of lack of data. It's very difficult. I haven't found, and I've been looking to find data that we can match exactly the student and the teacher that has been teaching the student. And you don't find that in England, we can't find that in Northern Europe, Nordic countries. So it's been really difficult for, for us here in, in Europe to really look exactly the impact teachers have on students' academic attainment. And of course, also other, uh, their future outcomes in life. Uh, but there are some small kind of studies uh, that have been looking at, but much in a much smaller scale. But unfortunately, we really haven't had the data to directly look at the what is the impact of the teacher that teaches a student on their uh, future outcomes and, of course, student academic attainment. Okay, let me ask you to speculate, which moves to the next question that I sent you. You say most of the stuff is regrettably done in the U.S., and we are about 4% of the world population and probably 4% of education going on worldwide. How would the answers from the U.S. differ if we looked at the U.K. or, let's say, a big continental country like Germany? Yeah, so um, that's an interesting question. I think if we were uh, to think about teachers as motivated agents, right, who exercise and the maximize their efforts, and they deeply care about profession, and then if we also think that teachers are drawn around the world from similar ability distribution, then it would be easy for us in a way to uh, use US studies because they, they will have external validity and to generalize. But actually, of course, this is not the case. And in the UK, but also in Europe, we've seen that the uh, individuals who go into teaching in terms of their ability, they now they come from different parts of the ability distribution. And of course, we have also different education systems around you know, the UK and the US. And they they change in terms of also how the teachers are motivating in terms of pay set and so on. So I I, I think it's uh, very difficult to draw on uh, U.S. evidence um, compared to what what we see in Europe because as I said, if if they were motivated agents and things were similar in terms of the ability distribution, hiring uh, teachers being let's say the the uh, individuals that come from the highest uh, level of ability then maybe we could have, but I don't think we are there yet. So it'd be really great if the policymakers can help us uh, to provide the right data so then we can try and answer those questions and see how similar those findings are with the ones in the U.S. that Eric just discussed about. And you, and you this speaks to the question. I mean, the, in the U.S., we do think that at least in secondary school, our teachers are paid less compared to the average than they are in Europe. That's the impression I get. Maybe that's, I don't know if that's correct or not. Eric, is that a reasonable assumption or? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, Dan. I'd have to, I'd have to go back and look it up. Okay. 
All right, I just wonder about that. We, um, if if I can uh, talk about how the uh, teachers are paid uh, in in the UK, I mean their their pay is uh, pretty low relative to the average uh, wage. But then you have countries like Luxembourg that have the highest. Um, I mean, teachers have this the highest pay. They are paid like I think on average hundred twenty thousand uh, dollars per year. So there is a lot of variation around Europe, and it would be interesting to see what the impact in terms of these pay sets and different pay might have in their uh, efforts, of course, and also in whether that matters for uh, student attainment. Let me welcome John Friedman, who is at Brown University and sitting in front of a wonderful background, which I remember is the Econ Building, at least it used to be at Brown University, a beautiful historic building. John, let me come back to a question. We've been on for a while and ask you, since you're the author of the lead research on this now, uh, take people at the 90th and let's go for the 10th percentile of earnings. How much of their earnings difference, adjusting for everything else that I could adjust for, is due to a difference in teachers per se? So teachers are incredibly important. And the answer to your question, I think, depends on the combination of two things. The first is we need to know how much of an impact teachers are having. And then the second part is about how much does teacher quality actually differ in practice between kids who end up at the top versus end up at the bottom or are coming from higher versus lower income families or something like that. And I think the answer to the first question is the teachers can make an enormous difference. So just to give you a sense, uh, the difference between having like a great teacher and an average teacher is going to increase lifetime earnings by about uh, two and a half, three percent. And so if you were to have that impact for, let's say, 12 or 13 years of your K through 12 education, you know, that's going to add up to 35 or 40 percent difference in earnings. Um, that's similar to the difference between incomes from children coming from the 90th versus the 25th percentile of family income. So it's kind of on a similar magnitude to many of these, you know, very uh, stark socioeconomic gradients in society. Uh, now, in practice, I don't think all of that difference is being caused by teachers because some of that difference is coming from education. Some of that difference is coming from uh, neighborhood effects. Some of that difference is coming from family effects. Some of that is coming from higher education. Um, and so, you know, I ballpark that something like a quarter to a third of those differences are coming from education. And then within education, I think most of it is coming from differences in teacher quality. Uh, so putting those together, I think kind of a, a solid chunk of the uh, gaps we see in society are driven by teacher quality. But because teachers are so impactful, if one were to really focus, for instance, on increasing teacher quality uh, for students from low-income backgrounds or other uh, underrepresented backgrounds, you know, you could have an effect beyond just the share of the existing gradient that it explains. Okay, this that leads to two more questions, but not if we have time for all of them. So first of all, you mentioned coming from different backgrounds. Let me ask each of you, maybe there's research on this, do teachers matter more for those from fancy backgrounds or those from uh, disadvantaged backgrounds? John, any thoughts on that? I'm gonna go around the room. So our research found kind of strikingly similar effects of moving from kind of a given scaled increase in teacher quality across the income distribution for children of different races um, in high versus low performing schools um, you know, really seemed in at least, you know, a very large city in the United States that uh, kind of teacher quality was, was, was teacher quality. Um, now, I think, you know, moving somewhat more broadly, there are some facets of teacher quality, for instance, uh, some of the work looking at non-cognitive, non-academic effects of teachers, for instance, some great work by Bo Jackson and co-authors, um, that element of teacher quality may have larger impacts for students from more disadvantaged backgrounds because those elements of teacher quality may be playing a larger substitute for, uh, you know, deficits in one's neighborhood or, or elsewhere in life. Uh, so, you know, just to give you an example, 
Think about the beginning of the pandemic. Um, the world is crashing down around us. Everybody has to go home. And in addition to the standard educational challenges, there are all these other issues like how do we get a tablet or a computer or internet access to students in their homes? How do we help students create a quiet space for them to learn while they're in their homes? Now, one let me interrupt you. Let me, let me ask. Right. I mean, this is an impressionistic question. Shkaponia, yeah, any thoughts of yours on this? Um, so what I think is that we really need to know more about the teacher's effectiveness on different types of students. And because so far it's established that we know teachers matter a lot. But the thing is how we can know like what kind of teachers are better to teach what kind of students. And I think we need we need more research on that. Of course, there is research, and I, I guess this is the same for schooling and university, that if I'm if I'm being taught by a teacher like me. For example, if more minority students are, are taught by a minority teacher, then uh, they, they seem to be more effective in raising their attainment. But then we can think, is, is that because they are role models or is that because they know more uh, what are uh, they are better equipped to teach these these type uh, of students? But I think what really matters and that's what I think we need more is how how much this teacher effectiveness, how we can raise, find ways how we can raise this teacher effectiveness, especially based on students' characteristics. And I think we need to know more, more uh, from that point of view. We need to see more research, especially in Europe as well, I think. <laughs> Eric, I was just going to add on what Shippen was saying. I think, you know, that's a great point. You know, there was an earlier era where teacher quality was measured not by outputs, but by inputs. And so increasing teacher quality was only about getting student, you know, teachers with, uh, you know, more likely to have a master's degree or something like that. Um, and when you view it from that perspective, you know, it's almost mechanical to get teachers of higher quality. Now, I think it's turned out that those input based measures of teacher quality don't actually seem to have that much impact on student uh, performance. And so now that we you know, are thinking a little bit more about this using outcome-based measures of performance, there's a whole set of work that can be done to relate all sorts of teacher training programs, summer learning courses, continuing education courses, what types of education degrees produce teachers that start out or after a couple of years have higher uh, teacher quality. And I think we've not cycled those types of teacher quality measures back into the training pipeline in the way that we need to. Just one, one, go ahead, Schiponia, then I'm so, No, just one, a, a small point there, because we don't know much which kind of training works. And I've been involved on a, I'm working on a project here in the UK, there is a small intervention. So they are training teachers and sending them to the worst performing schools. And actually we find no impact in the short term, but we're going to still see it's, it's kind of an experiment. It's very interesting, but we need more of those as, as yeah. you were saying. Yeah. But this is, this is a very, I mean, it's, it's not often that I feel encouraged that we've ever learned anything in our business. And yet these comments suggest we haven't learned at least that pure input based measures, degree measures of teacher are not measured of teacher quality. That's an advance in our knowledge, I think. Eric, thoughts about this general issue? I mean, just the only thing to add is, you know, I, I, I certainly agree that the, the sort of blunt measures of inputs, like whether or not somebody has a master's degree, don't seem to be helpful at all. I think earlier in the conversation I was mentioning that seems to be true for teacher certification as well. There's sort of an intermediate class where maybe there's a little bit of, of, of hope for optimism, and that is that there's more and more school systems are using these sort of rubric-based classroom observations that measure things like you know, how good is a teacher at asking questions in a classroom setting or how good are they at uh, redirecting misbehavior of students? So that's closer to uh, those are certainly more specific inputs and sort of closer to a measure of skills, though not really a measure of skills. Um, and they're correlated with outputs like uh, teachers contributions to test scores. Uh, but but it could very well be that there's some omitted variable that is lurking around here uh, that that would make us cautious about causal claims. I will say back to sort of where this question started, um, in some of our uh, research in England recently, there is a positive, it, it is the case that uh, students who start out lower achieving are benefited more by having a teacher who is uh, on these classroom observation based measures uh, sort of better at things like asking questions and and student misbehavior. So 
that, that, that sort of suggests that maybe there the answer to your original question, Dan, is yes, but um, sort of a lot of work yet to do because those are still sort of mostly correlational um, uh, results. I want to finish up by talking, and this alludes a little bit to something Scriponia said earlier, talking about university teaching, which is relevant for all the people on this video, I think. As a senior person over many years, I've had to observe teachers in my departments teaching. And I knew within 15 minutes who was good and who was mediocre at best. John's probably doing some of this now since he's now an administrator part time, I think. And I know, and yet if you ask me to characterize it with anything I think is measurable, I couldn't do it. This is observational. I mean, it's like Potter Stewart's line about pornography. I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. Teaching is the same way. Now, one aspect of this people are pushing for, and Scaponia alluded to this, is a teacher who looks like her or his students. Ethnic, gender, racial, blah, 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 matching. Does this matter? John, Eric, and we'll finish up with Scaponia. John, what do you think? So there's clear, good evidence, you know, both in the K through 12 and in the university setting that the kind of teacher student match matters. I think the evidence on uh, gender suggests that it is more focused on specific areas. So for instance, in STEM fields, it seems like the effect of, a, of a, a, a female student having a female teacher is maybe not as much about just conveying the information per se. It's more about giving them the sense that being a scientist or a mathematician or whatever it is, is something that women do. It is an outcome that is plausible to think about. And so I think, uh, you know, even then when you go to uh, high school, I think a lot of the effects have this aspirational feel to it. Uh, my sense is that the literature on same race matching seems to find somewhat larger effects. Um, and whether that's because the kind of aspirational issues are broader or because there's actually some particular, you know, advantage in, um, you know, holding one's attention or conveying the material, I think it's a little bit hard to know. But uh, yeah, there's, there's, you know, clearly uh, some effects. I, I would say that, you know, still, you know, the effects are not enormous. Right. It, you know, if you had a choice between having a good teacher that was not a gender race match or a bad teacher who was a gender race match, I think you'd take the good teacher who was not a gender race match kind of any day of the week. But I think this type of representation, to the extent that it's not a trade off with teaching quality, it's just another dimension to consider is another way to really improve uh, what's going on in the classroom. Eric? I mean, I think John said uh, all, all of the sort of important things. I, I might add, like, there, there is this hypothesis that some of the effects that we see in these matching cases is sort of aspirational, or some people call them role model effects. Um, another hypothesis is that there's something about the production process that um, that sharing gender or sharing a racial or, or ethnic background sort of provides the teacher some insights into how to uh, teach the student that someone else might not have. Um, th those are two, I think, plausible hypotheses. We just don't know quite how to separate them, but they have very different implications for how how we might expand those benefits um, beyond beyond just simply trying to match students in the in the assignment process. Shabonia, let's finish uh, up with you. Yeah, well, colleagues said it really. I, I'm not <laughs> sure how much else I can add, but I mean, evidence does suggest that. Uh, if I'm being told by a professor like me, uh, as John said, it does have an impact, but it's not huge. But still, you see increasing graduation rates and maybe also, uh, for example, you see women that uh, going up in the education ladder, for example, are all taking more, uh, studying more in STEM and also succeeding there and also outcomes, their future outcomes in the labor market. But as I said, it would be good to see more research on that as well. More research is needed. That's a usual conclusion. I conclude more than that, and I want to ask each of you if this is reasonable. I think we've learned an awful lot about the what in this question about the teachers matter. Have we learned anything at all about the why? Eric? 
the why. I, I'm yeah, not sure. Why do teachers matter? What is it? I mean, we know that there's X effect, this percent, that percent. But have we learned a lot about why they matter? What's actually going on? Or am I being too negative? Eric? I mean, I think we, we're that sort of, in some ways, is circling back to where we started at the beginning of the conversation. Um, I don't think we understand what gives rise to the differences between teachers. There, there, there are some other things we haven't talked about today that, um, that suggest some sort of productive avenues, at looking at interventions to try to help teachers uh, be more effective. And those interventions don't just have to be formal training in a classroom. They might be things like, you know, um, mentorship or exposing teachers to higher performing and more effective peers. And in those cases, we have seen some evidence of uh, teacher performance improving in ways that is lasting. So if you are around uh, higher performing peers, uh, peer teachers, that is, then when you move on to your next assignment, you sort of take something with you. So there are some of those things that uh, that we didn't get into today that that do suggest some 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 hypotheses about the why question, uh, where, you know, to put a finer point on it, like how do teachers learn how to be teachers? Um, but it doesn't seem to be in formal classrooms. So we still have, um, we still have lots of, of interesting things to figure out there. We can go on forever. Let me ask a different question of all of you, okay? I was thrown into teaching my fourth year of grad school at Yale. These poor kids are paying a lot of money to have this absolutely inexperienced individual. Can we do better in our universities? John is department chair. What should we do? Then the rest of you, quickly. I have not seen experience to be that highly related with teaching quality, other than and everybody's not that great the first time. And I think, you know, I agree with you. These students are paying a lot of money. To be honest, I'm not sure that I care more for my own students here who are paying a lot of money versus students who are not paying a lot of money or who are at a school where it doesn't cost very much. I think, you know, everybody should be entitled to high quality teaching, but you got to start somewhere. And I think it's hard to imagine how one starts uh, in a lower stakes environment. So typically, I think these days, Graduate students, as they're learning to teach, start more in discussion sections or something that's a little bit smaller, a little bit um, you know, easier to screw up. Um, by the time people are faculty, again, my sense is like, you know, you give them one year and then they're about as good as they're gonna be. Um, some people have a knack for it, some people don't, some people care about it, some people don't. And so my sense is so long as people are putting in a good faith effort and we are recognizing and rewarding the people who are really good at it to make it clear that it is something we care about, I think we put on a good product. Okay. Uh, Chikaponia, a European? Yes. Um, well, I can bring actually uh, the evidence I found uh, in one of my very recent papers. It is for schooling, but I'm sure we can take those and like put them in a university kind of context. So what I found is, for example, teacher turnover does matter and teachers seem to be disruptive if they face new students in the first year. So, and in a way it, it goes to with you facing those students for the first time and if you haven't taught before. So in a way is this lack of, if you like human specific capital because you don't know about the, 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 the cohort you are teaching. And in a sense that can be a little bit disruptive. But what we found is that uh, the second year, that negative impact, disruptive impact, which was very small anyway, it was completely gone. And then, of course, as we know, experience, uh, experience does matter. Um, Eric told, uh, told us a little bit earlier that we know that the first couple of years it, it increases and then it kind of plateaus off uh, in the latest few years. But I think what, what matters as well, we, we saw that schools that have money, and I guess universities that have money, they find a way that maybe those uh, potential uh, graduates who teach, maybe they go um, and observe classrooms, how they're taught, and maybe they, do, they don't do uh, teaching per se, but maybe they do classes and so on. So in, in order to mitigate that potential uh, disruption effect that first year of teaching has. Okay. Eric, last thing, finish up on this, then we're done. I think one idea we can borrow from our colleagues in primary and secondary schools is, have, is observing each other teach more often. 
Uh, that's sort of nerve wracking. I've had my colleagues come. I, I work at the Graduate <laughs> School of Education. I'm surrounded by people who are excellent teachers and it's nerve wracking to have them come and sit in the back of the room. But that kind of feedback from someone more experienced, I think is, um, you know, there's some good evidence from primary and secondary education that that can be a useful input. And I suspect that's probably also true for all of us. Um, and also just watching other more experienced people teach, you know, provide some opportunity to pick up uh, to pick up ideas and skills. So, you know, maybe we could do more of that. It, it is ner it is nerve wracking, but if we get over our fears, I think uh, we might be better off in the long run. Believe me, as a senior person, it's at least as nerve wracking for the observer as those <laughs> who've observed. I've found. Anyway, it's been a pleasure having all three of you here today: John Friedman of Brown University, Eric Taylor of Harvard Ed School, Shkiponya Tel High of the University of Sussex. Thanks very much for your time, folks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Too. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, Dan.